Come on, anybody in the building love Jesus tonight? Come on, I said, does anybody love Jesus tonight? You can go ahead and be seated. Oh, Elevation Youth X in the building. It is such an honor. I mean, an incredible honor to be with you. Uh, I hope you know that you are in uh, one of the greatest churches in the world. And uh, the songs, the messages that have come from this place that have given hope to so many people, I hope you're taking good notes while you can because you have a front row seat uh, to something truly special. I want to take a moment to honor Pastor Stephen and Holly Furtick, who are just some of the most incredible pastors and leaders uh, on the planet. I know I am grateful for uh, every sacrifice that they have made to make this place what it is. And I realize that you are Elevation Church, and there are many people uh, that your leadership team could have called on to share with you today, and I'm honored to, to be one of them. And uh, I want us to look uh, in Matthew chapter 14. Uh, I like Matthew, because uh, in case you came here today, your friend tricks you into coming to Youth X, or they paid for you. If they paid for you, that's a good friend. Keep them. Um, I like Matthew because Matthew, uh, he, he didn't start off as a church person. He was a tax collector. Uh, if you don't know anything about tax collectors in the Bible, uh, tax collectors were not good people. Don't, don't just think IRS or government. Think IRS meets gangsters, okay? They used to bully people out of money. And uh, they were social outcasts. They didn't have any friends. Tax collectors were so bad that the Bible actually says that Jesus was eating with sinners and tax collectors. Okay, they got their own category. A murderer would say, at least I'm not a tax collector. Okay, like these were not good people. Yet uh, Matthew was that. And Jesus gave him an invitation he could not refuse. And he signed up for a three and a half year internship that absolutely changed his life. And he writes this story. He says, immediately after this, speaking of Jesus feeding 5,000, Jesus insisted that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up to the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble far away from land for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. Somebody say heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over to the other side of the boat, walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? Tonight, I want to speak to you on the subject of the Me Too boat. The Me Too boat. Can we pray together? Father, I thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to speak to your people. God, I pray that there would be a moment tonight where I get out of the way and you speak loud and clear to each and every person under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, I pray. Everybody say it. Uh, I grew up in an African Methodist Episcopal church. What that means is church was black. Okay, that's this is what it means. Okay, uh, my dad was the pastor. I loved my dad's church. It was small. It was intimate, um, and I loved the rules of engagement uh, of my dad's church. Uh, the sign outside of our church said, "Service is going to start at 9:15." Uh, service usually started whenever we got there. That could be 925, 945. It really didn't matter all that much when our church would actually start because it was more about when it would end. We used to be there probably like two, three, four, five hours. You should bring a snack at my dad's church, okay? Because you could be there for a while, okay? That, that was what it was like. Uh, another rule uh, at my parents' church was uh, you couldn't say that you were sick. It was a way of like, you, you're speaking something wrong over your life. 
And so you could be throwing up in the bathroom and they'd be like, the devil is a liar. I'd be like, nah, I think I just ate something bad. Okay. Nevertheless, uh, I'd be like, mom, I'm, I'm throwing up. Like I'm clearly sick. She goes, nah, you're getting sin out your life. That's what you're doing. I'm like, no, I'm, I really think I'm, 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 I'm kind of sick. Uh, then in fifth grade, uh, my father unfortunately suffered a stroke uh, where the left side of his body was shut down completely and uh, he was forced uh, to have to give up his church. And I was attending a school that was connected to a predominantly Caucasian large church. And so my, my parents said, hey, why don't you just go to church with your friends? And so uh, at that point in sixth grade, um, I had never been to white church in my life, y'all. Listen, white church experience for the first time, yo, was crazy, okay? Listen, when they say 915, they're not bluffing, okay? I'm telling you, drummer starts, click track, they going right away. I messed around and showed up at 930. They talking about they only got one song left. I'm like, at my church, we would just be warming up. Like, what are we doing? They had snacks in the lobby. You had to fast and pray at my daddy's church. They had no kind of snacks. We had donuts. I said, listen, white church got it going on, okay? Then um, they had this thing. I had never seen it before in my life. It said children's ministry. And I was like, children's ministry? What's that? They're like, oh, it's this whole section for kids to play while adults are in church. Children's ministry for me was the front row with my mama, okay? And if you started talking in the middle of church, you got a pinch and a twist, okay? You had a mid-service pinch and a post-service butt whooping, okay? Like, that's just how it was, okay? So I'm like, I really, I'm really liking this church. Then something crazy happens. I promise you, I, never, I couldn't believe what would happen next. At 1015, the pastor comes to the edge of the stage and he says, amen, have a great week. And all of a sudden, everybody got up and started leaving. I said, hey, uh, where y'all going? He said, service is over. I said, y'all doing intermission at y'all church? Y'all, everybody go take a bathroom break? What, what's going on? They're like, we're, going, we're, we're, we're leaving. I was like, what do you do with, like, y'all, I've never, every time I've gotten out of church, it was dark outside. Okay, so I'm sitting here trying to figure out where everybody's going. They said, we're going to brunch. I said, what is brunch? I've never heard of this thing. They're like, bro, you've never heard of brunch? I said, is it like breakfast and lunch? I'm smart. I can figure that out. They're like, yeah, man, you can get chicken or waffles, or you can get both. I said, I think I'm going to give my life to Jesus right now, okay? This is amazing. I said, man, I don't know if I'm ever going to leave white church. This is awesome. I told my parents, y'all need to get it together, okay? Because they're killing y'all right now, okay? Right, right. Uh, then in college, I went to a, a multicultural church. And then at 18 years old, I saw something I had never seen before in my life. I saw African-Americans, Caucasians, Hispanics, Asians, a whole conglomerate of people worshiping together, singing the same song. I said, this must be what heaven is going to be like. And you know what I love about that is sometimes worship can bring us together when we live in a divided world. There's something about the presence of the Lord that makes us leave our labels behind. And all of a sudden, you just it all fades to the distance and you just focus on Jesus. I said, man, could this be what heaven would look like? I noticed two things at all three churches that I love. In the small black church, in the large white church, and in the large multicultural church, it looks a lot like this. Each of them gave people an opportunity to surrender their life to Jesus. Despite their theological differences, they had that one thing in common, and that was the moment that I began to fall in love with the church. The second thing that I noticed about all three churches, despite their theological differences, if they all had the same phrase that they used, usually towards the beginning of their service, come just as you are. Oh, and I, I believed it too, right? You know, you come just as you are. And it made sense for the, the first time visitor, but the, the longer I started saying it myself, I didn't know if we really meant it because the longer you're in the church space, it goes from come just as you are to fake it till you make it. I mean, just think about it for a second. How real can you really be here? I mean, like, let's say somebody sees you in the lobby. Hey, Antoine, how's it going? Oh, uh, man, uh, my dad can't stand my mom, so he left, and my life is, is horrible. How about you? Like, you can't say that. 
Like, you can't be like, hey, uh, my parents broke. They both lost their job, but we still trying to impress our neighbors pretending to be rich. So how's your life? Like, you, you can't say, yeah, my boyfriend just broke up with me. I'm probably going to be alone for the rest of my life, but God's faithful. Like, you can't say that. So, it, so on some level, we decide to just wear a mask. We just decide to use spiritual phrases to cover who we really are because I think we're all searching for a place where we can be the real us. And it can be very, very difficult to do that. We can sometimes make it difficult for one another to do that. And sometimes you can even be at church and be the loneliest person in the room, surrounded by thousands, but still alone. Proximity to a person doesn't somehow solve our loneliness issue. And so oftentimes, whether we're in school or in church, we will settle for the mass because life experiences have taught us that's sometimes the only way we'll ever get accepted. I think there's three issues with the mass. <laughs> the first problem with the mass <laughs> is you might actually succeed at fooling people. You might actually get people to fall in love with your mask, but all of a sudden, it, it's not you. So you got followers. You're like, I did it. I got, I got popularity. I did it. But now they're going, but it ain't really me. You got them to date you, and you're deathly afraid that they're going to find out you. You, you got fake off whites, you got fake Jordans, you got them from China, and you waited six weeks to get a compliment because that's how long it takes to get it from China. Like, like you're sitting there trying to wear this mask, but the problem is, is when you get a compliment on something that's fake, it makes the compliment feel just as fake as the shoes. So now you're going, man, I thank you for the compliment, but you, you don't know the real story. The second problem with the mask is it's exhausting. Oh, it's so exhausting because I was cool last week, but I'm not now. I got to change who I listen to now. I got I to gotta change my outfit now. I got to change my shoes now. Wait, we're not listening to them anymore? Okay. Oh, we're watching them on YouTube now? Okay. Like th this is… And I got a feeling there's somebody on the sound of my voice. You're just tired. And if you're honest, you wish you could just call a timeout and say, can I just be me for a minute? Can I just be the, the real me and, and still have the admiration and still have the acceptance? The third problem with the mask is you will always live in fear that somebody's going to find out who you really are. You're walking around like a superhero, hoping that nobody finds out your true identity hoping that your followers don't find out that you are indeed a fraud and you've been tricking them this whole time. Can you imagine what would happen in your life if you truly believed that God loved you and would use you just as you are, without the upgrades, without the alterations, without the popular… Like, like just as you are, hey, uh, you're enough for me to use you. Uh, one of my favorite authors is Brene Brown, and she says it like this. There is a massive difference between fitting in and belonging. Fitting in means I will make as many adjustments as I need to to make you like me and admire me and follow me, which means my fans, my followers, my family, and my friends are the governors of my life, and they get to dictate the direction my life is headed. So I, I got to do whatever I can to fit in. Belonging, on the other hand, says, I'm willing to be the real me, even if it means I have to stand alone. Even if it means that, I, you know what, listen, you may not like the real me, but you know what, at least whoever does love me, whoever does accept me, it is actually me. What have you ever done to fit in? What, what, what have you ever sacrificed to, to, to fit in? <laughs> Shout out to, to, to my homie that laughs at jokes that aren't funny to fit in because life experiences often teach us it doesn't feel as bad if we make fun of ourselves before somebody else can. 
Even if you're punching yourself, it still hurts. <laughs> Shout out to my friends of color who have had to laugh at racist jokes just to survive. It wasn't even funny, but you thought, if I, if I don't laugh, I'll be isolated and I won't have any friends. So you ha ha and he he your way into the circle, but you don't even feel comfortable because you feel like they can't even see the real you. What I, I felt compelled to tell you tonight is you have to choose belonging over fitting in. You have to choose belonging over fitting in. I, I, I believe that the cure for loneliness has two components to it, and the first one is this. It's accepting yourself for who you really are just as God made you. Other people can't like the real you until you like the real you. Until you have accepted the real you, how is anybody else going to accept the real you just as God made you? I, you know who I think felt this tension a lot? Peter. Peter is somewhat of a misfit in the group of disciples. He, he, don't, he don't really belong with everybody. He's older than all of disciples. the disciples. Scholars tell us. Uh, he got a little bit of anger problems. Um, they tried to arrest Jesus. He pulled out a sword, cut off somebody's ear. Peter, where you get a sword from? We was just praying for people. Blind eyes, deaf ears. We was feeding fish to people. Where you get a sword from, bruh? I like Peter. I think he gives hope, hope for thugs. You know what I mean? Like, you love Jesus, but you still have cut somebody. You know what I'm saying? Like, that, that's Peter. He's, he's trying to figure some things out. He's like, I don't know if I belong with everybody else, but my, this group of disciples, they are at the Sea of Galilee. Um, I got a picture of the Sea of Galilee. I got a chance to go visit uh, the Sea of Galilee a couple years ago. It is really a, a beautiful place. Uh, in fact, we got to have a worship service on the Sea of Galilee. Ladies and gentlemen, if you ever get an opportunity to go to the Sea of Galilee, you're going to be acting way more spiritual than you really are. You're going to be like, I think I can walk on water. No, you can't. You're going to drown. Okay, You're going to die. Stay your butt on the shore and put your AirPods in and listen to oceans. That's all you can do. Okay. <laughs> but you'll be thinking all types of crazy stuff at the Sea of Galilee. Like, man, this is, this is where it happened. And in the photo, it looks calm. But in this story, it is the very opposite. And you know what I love? I love that the disciples found themselves in a storm by obeying Jesus. What did he tell them to do? Go home. They were just going home, and they found themselves in a storm. Some people believe that following Jesus means I shouldn't have any problems. Following Jesus means I shouldn't have any storms, that my life should be storm-free. But following Jesus doesn't mean you won't have any storms. Following Jesus simply means you will have an anchor for every storm that you go through. That is what Jesus is communicating to his disciples. And it's an interesting story to me. Um, there's a few lines that Peter says that I'm just going, Peter, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I kind of put myself on the boat as one of the other disciples, kind of listening to this conversation that he's having with Jesus. We all scared. We're on the boat. We're like, hey, we about to die. I don't know what's about to happen. It looks like a ghost is coming to us, and it don't look like Casper. Like, like something is about to happen. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, Jesus said, hey, it's me, JC. Don't worry about it. I got y'all. Then Peter says something crazy. He says, uh, if it's you, call me out on the water. Hey, Peter, there's a couple other ways to figure out if it's Jesus. Ask him what your favorite color is. Yellow. See, told you. Like, there are so many other ways to find out if it's Jesus. Well, and, and here's what you must understand about Matthew chapter 14. Is we've already seen this movie before in Matthew chapter 8. The disciples were on the boat with Jesus this time, and there was a storm, and he calmed it. So most of us would go, hey, Jesus, why don't you, if it's you, just calm the storm. But for Peter, he's going, I need something a little bit more this time. For the sequel, I don't need you to do what you did last time. I need you to do something new in my life. Now, what would compel Peter to actually have Jesus invite him to walk on the water? 
In the Jewish context, there were three levels of education. At the highest level, a rabbi would say, follow me. This was one of the greatest invitations in society. If, you got, if, if a rabbi said, follow me, it, it was like being drafted into the NBA. Okay? This is why you see in Scripture so many people dropping everything going on in their life to follow Jesus because they're going, I, I I've all, I, I never got this opportunity. In fact, at that third level, if you weren't good enough, which was most people, the rabbi would tell you, you're not good enough to be a rabbi. Go home and just do the family trade. You'll never be more than a fisherman. You'll never be more than a carpenter. You'll never be more than a farmer. That's your, that's your lane. Save the rabbi stuff for maybe somebody in your kid. Maybe one of your kids will become a rabbi someday, but this isn't in the cards for you. The common denominator of every disciple that Jesus had is they had already been told no. This is why Peter had dropped his nets and said, wait a minute, me? You're picking me? A disciple following a rabbi in Jesus' time, they followed their rabbi with everything. of their. They wanted to do everything like the rabbi. They, they wanted to spend money like the rabbi. They wanted to treat other people like the rabbi. They wanted to read scripture like the rabbi. In fact, historians would say that a disciple wanted to follow a rabbi so bad that if that rabbi had had an, a, a war injury and he had a cane and walked with a limp, that a young disciple would actually break a branch off of a tree and pretend to walk with a limp just to be like the rabbi. Understand, ladies and gentlemen, Peter's logic is if my rabbi is walking on water, I'm walking on water, okay? Like, yes, Jesus, if it's you, then yes, call me out. Now he's kind of looking back at the other disciples going, I don't know if y'all want to go for a walk, but I can't let your opinion keep me from getting to Jesus. Like, I, I don't know what y'all left, but for me, I, I got to I gotta get out of the boat. You got a crazy friend in your life that just be doing crazy stuff all the time? Man, I got some crazy... Y'all, listen, I, I'm not an outdoorsy person. People are always trying to take me camping with lions, tigers, and bears and stuff. I'd be like, for what? Why? Why? Why are we doing this? Okay, I don't want to die today. Why do I want to get eaten by a bear? Uh, I was speaking at a camp uh, about a month ago. And I checked into the hotel. I promise I can't make this up. The lady handed me a piece of paper. It said the following. Don't feed the bears. I said, uh, ma'am, the paper you just handed me, it says don't feed the bears. Is this like a euphemism? Like, is this a joke? Like, what, 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 who's feeding bears? They said, oh, sometimes the bears come into the parking lot. And if you leave food in your car, they're going to eat it. Ma'am, let me talk to you for a second. Listen, um... You trying to tell me the bears are gonna come about the woods? They're gonna unlock my car and grab my subway because, um, and you're telling me make sure I don't feed the bear. Like, so if I see a bear, you want me to just not feed it? That's what you're trying to tell me right now. Like, you're telling a grown man don't feed the bear. She's like, yeah. If you see a bear, call me, ma'am. I'm really not trying to be offensive right now, but let me just tell you something. You about five feet, okay? If 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 it's the bear versus you, I got my money on the bear, okay? What do you have back there that's gonna fight a bear, okay? My buddy with me is like, dude, this is awesome. No, it's not. We about to die, okay? We're leaving, okay? They're going to need to get somebody else. This is Peter. He, he did, he's that crazy friend. You're like, Peter, are you sure? There's, there's some other ways that we can follow Jesus when he get back on the boat. Right. He's going, nah. Y'all don't understand. We might be on the same boat, but why do I feel like we're going through different storms? Why is it that I'm here with my other Jesus followers, but I feel all alone? I feel all by myself. You might have came to the same conference singing the same songs, but you're kind of looking at your neighbor like, we ain't going through the same thing. I got I gotta more to get. You don't know what I'm going home to. Listen, I got to get everything that I possibly can out of this conference. I ain't got time for your approval. I ain't got time for your opinion because I got to get to Jesus. And he starts walking on water. He can't even believe his own. He's like, oh my God, I'm walking on water. He got his eyes on Jesus. He's, he's getting, he's like, man, this is, this is amazing. And then he got his eyes on the winds and the waves. And the Bible says he began to sink. Uh, Tim, come up here. 
I want to illustrate this. I, I really want them to get this picture. You want to be Jesus, you want to be Peter. I'll be Jesus, black Jesus. Go ahead, you go over there. I got this. I got this. That's another sermon for another day. They ain't ready for that. Okay. All right, so y'all so silly. Okay, listen. All right, so Peter, he gets out of the boat. All right, get out the boat. Ah, 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 ah. All right. Now you're gonna walk towards me. Walk towards me. Hey, hey, hey. Now look at the winds and waves. Now drown. Come on, drown. Fall to the guy. Hey, I got you. 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 And then Jesus, with his arm around him, this is scripture, he says, Why'd you doubt me? You got such little faith. Now watch, watch this. The next verse says this. And you may never have caught this in the text. It's very interesting. He says, When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. All right, let's re illustrate this one more time. Get back in the boat. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to be black Jesus over here. I got this, okay? This is how Matthew tells the story, okay? Peter gets out the boat, bang, comes over, bop, 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 winds and waves, bam, drown, drown, come on, I got you, all right, bet, bet, okay. Why did you have such little faith? Why did you doubt me? And then the next part of the story, it says, come back over here, it fast forwards, guys, it fast forwards, back to the boat, and it says, when they got back in the boat, let's get back in the boat, hey, okay, now we back in the boat, it says, now the wind stopped. Therefore, this is what we must conclude from what the Bible doesn't tell us. Come back over here. Come on, 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 come on. We must conclude that Jesus and Peter walked back through the storm together. Hey, I got a feeling that there's somebody in here who has been making a prayer and you've been saying, God, stop the storm. When your real prayer should be, Jesus, walk with me through every trial, through every situation, through every circumstance in my life. I got a feeling that there's somebody under the sound of my voice, and you've been walking through a storm alone. I felt compelled to come from Dallas, Texas, to tell every single person, you don't have to walk through it alone. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't, I don't know when you're going to get to the other side. I do believe breakthrough is coming. I believe that. I do. But I don't know when. But I do know that in the meantime, your prayer shouldn't be, Lord, peace be still. Stop the storm. Lord, when... Bring my parents back together. Lord, ease the pain. God, when am I not going to be insecure? When am I going to get over this depression? When am I going to get over this anxiety? When is my heart going to be whole? I don't know when you're going to make it to the other side. But don't fast forward the story. You ought to walk with the Lord, young person. Walk with the Lord. And Peter don't got to get back in the boat and go, I told y'all. I don't know what y'all was thinking. I told y'all Jesus got me. No, no, no. He, he got something out in the water. He would have never gotten a boat. A walk to remember. I'll never forget it. I, I believe that there's, there's something in us that wants God. Jesus to take our pain away, but I think he wants to meet you right where you are. Just as you are. I think our go-to prayer is, God, would you change my circumstance? I don't know when that's going to happen. But this I know. Your God has never forsaken you. And his promise to you is that he will be with you. Let the storm come as long as I got Jesus. <laughs> and here's the funny thing. A life that has been consistently walking with the Lord through every season, through every trial, through every circumstance, eventually your breakthrough will come. Okay? 
And one day, you will look back and go, my God was with me all along. And this is what I know. When you are walking with the Lord, you do not look like what you've been through. They could be like, hey, uh, hey man, I, I could have sworn you, you don't look like you was abused. You don't look like your heart was broken. You don't look like your parents went through the book. You don't look like I know I, I went through some things, but I, I had some help. I had somebody on my side. I had somebody with me that was for me. Come on, is there anybody in the building that's grateful for the presence of the Lord in their life? Come on, let's sing one time. The Lord is in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, drive us away. The Lord is in this place. The Lord is in this place. Not for a minute was I forsaken. The Lord. you to grab the hand of the person on your right and on your left. I believe the second component of the cure for loneliness is not just accepting yourself for who God has really made you to be. It's also accepting others for who God made them to be. Sometimes it's about extending grace to the person on our left and our right, giving them permission to be themselves. You don't want to be the person that's making people jump through hoops to prove their worth in your friendship circle. No, I'm going to let you be you. I'm going to let you be in pain. I'm going to let you be vulnerable. I'm going to let you go through some things because the thing that we have in common is that Jesus is with us. And I realize he made you different than me, and that's okay. We might see things differently on politics. We might see things different in sports. We, we might be into different music. You may not dress like me. You may, you may not follow the people that I follow, but guess what? You know what? I'm going to be the type of person that says, hey, man, why don't you come? Why don't you come sit with me? You imagine if we became people that looked for lonely people and said, hey, I don't want anybody in my lunch room to sit by themselves. That's my rule. Say, so, nobody sits by themselves at my school. Nobody sits by themselves at my park, in my, in my gym, in my court. No, nobody does. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at the person on your right. I want you to say, sometimes I make mistakes. <laughs> All right. Now, this is what I want you to do. I want you to look back at that person and say, me too. All right, let's do another one. I want you to look at the person your neighbor, the other one that you might like a little bit better. Um, I want you to say, uh, sometimes I try and impress people. What? You do? You be trying to impress people sometimes? What? Now look back at him and say, me too. All right, I got one more for you. Sometimes I'm not okay. That's all right. You want to know why? Because we're going to look back at each other and say, me too. Do you realize we just made the world a little bit less lonely of a place in 60 seconds? Thank you.
you imagine? Can you imagine if your e-groups look like this? Can you imagine if your e-group was a place where people could come and go, hey man, sometimes I'm not okay. Hey man, I made some mistakes this week. Hey, things aren't okay at home. I got, I got some issues. Can you imagine if that wasn't a place of, you what? No, get it together, man. Fake it till you make it. Pretend your way into a reality. Wear a mask until it becomes who you are. No. What would you do if I told you that God could give you real joy? You don't got to do the fake stuff. Because what I know about each and every one of us is that all of us are in the Me Too boat. We, we've all found ourselves in need of the same grace that we give to somebody when they first walk in. Come just as you are. Can I encourage you to keep coming just as you are? Amen. Don't wear the mask. Choose belonging over fitting in. We believe in the youth.